going to turn on the microphone. Okay. Okay. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are gathered together again uh, to remember our Lord Jesus Christ in the way we have been instructed to do. And to help us with that, to that end is our, we will be having words of exhortation and encouragement this day. I also want to wish each and every one of you here today a very happy new year. And this, hopefully, uh, we will see an improvement to the chaos that has been through going on in, in this world in the last year. And uh, hopefully we'll be witness to the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ this year. That would be a wonderful, wonderful thing to happen. So let us, uh, before we, we begin with uh, readings and exhortation, uh, would you please bow with me at this time as we seek God's blessing on our service this morning. Our Father who art in heaven, how be thy great and thy most holy name. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have this time together to read from your word of truth, to sing and to hear hymns of praise, and especially, Father, to remember your son in the way we've been instructed to do. Ask and pray, Father, that you will be with those who are unable to be with us this morning around this table. Ask that you would bless them as they have need and bring them together with us once again. I also ask and pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are experience adversity in their lives, whether it be from the this plague that's going on or because of the politics of the place where they live. I ask and pray that you will help them to remain strong in these last days and help them with help them with patience and hopeful expectation. Look forward to the great day when your son will return. And we ask and pray that you will bless those who continue to preach this word, the word of truth to those around us, that you will bless them and strengthen them to this end, that all they do may be done to thine honor and to thy glory. And also, Father, help us, O Lord, that all we do may be a praise from our whole hearts, that we may by our actions and our words and our deeds, show forth thy marvelous works throughout this world. So we also ask, Father, that you will help Brother Martin in leading us in exhortation this morning, that we may be mindful of the things that we listen to and use them as a help and guidance throughout not only this day, but throughout the coming year. And it's in Jesus' name we do give thee praise and thanks for all your blessings. Amen. Hey. Our reading for today is taken from Matthew chapter 5. And Brother Brad Stevens is going to lead us in that reading, and you may begin any time now, Brother Brad. Reading, <clears throat> excuse me, reading from Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, that is Jesus, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And you have, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be recon reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with, it, with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall, shall not swear falsely, but shall per perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is, is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, 
and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the, gen even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Thank you, Brother Brad. At this time, I ask for your careful attention as our brother Martin Webster from the Kitchener Waterloo Ecclesia leads us in the word of exhortation. And brother Martin, the Zoom meeting is now yours. Can you hear me? We've had a computer problem here. We've had to change computers at the last minute. And I can't, can hardly hear you, so um, it's a bit disconcerting, but we'll, we will continue. Well, brothers and sisters, in our readings this morning in Matthew chapter 5, what we have is Matthew, under divine inspiration, really bringing together much of Jesus' teaching. And by the time this, what we is generally called the Sermon on the Mount, which is... Um, which it generally is these five chapters, five, six, and seven. By the time this is given, Jesus is about probably 18 months, uh, 21 months into his ministry. This is not at the beginning. This is really at the end. So it would be about halfway through. And what we have here is a summary of what the Lord is talking about in relation to things concerning the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a phrase that is really unique to the Gospel of Matthew. When you go, go to the Gospel of Luke, it's the kingdom of God, and, and that's not even a phrase that's used much in, in the other, uh, other, um, other, other, other Gospels. But in this collection of some eight, what, 12 verses here at the beginning of this chapter, we have what are well known as the Beatitudes. And it starts off, of course, with the poor in spirit. Jesus talks about the mourners, the meek, the hungry, the merciful, and the persecuted. There's really quite something quite striking about these um, these sayings of the Lord, because if you look at the very first one, verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I'll go down to verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there's a certain sense in which the Lord Jesus is talking about people having the kingdom or being in the kingdom in some kind of sense. And yet when you look at the intervening verses, the um, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry and thirsty, the merciful, the pure in heart and the peacemakers, uh, the word that the Lord gives here is they shall be, which is something future tense. So how do we understand these, the, these phrases? How do we understand what the Lord is really trying to convey? See, what I think the, uh, the Lord is doing here is presenting to us a picture of the kind of person, kind of people we need to be in relation to the kingdom of heaven and being actually being in it. And what's more, brothers and sisters, there's something very strong about these phrases because when he says theirs is the kingdom of heaven they shall be comforted and so on um, they shall be filled what he's implying is that it's only those people who will experience these things it's only those kinds of people who will be in the kingdom of heaven it's only those kinds of people who will be filled or will be comforted or who will see God. And this is rather a startling phrase, a startling understanding, because what the Lord Jesus is doing is presenting to us a picture of those who will be in the kingdom, and only this kind of person will be in the kingdom of heaven. So immediately, our attention is drawn to the fact that Christianity is a very exclusive thing, because it is narrowed down to people with these characteristics. It's brought down to people who have these aspects of character, and it's only those kinds of people 
that will be in the kingdom of heaven. As I say, it's, it's, it's a very, very exclusive thing. Christianity is very, very exclusive. And yet when you turn that coin over, Christianity is very inclusive because it is not limited to people of a certain race, the race of Israel or Jewish people, or people of any particular language or particular race or, uh, or ethnic origin or anything like that. It's anybody who can have these characteristics. So on the other one hand, while Christianity is very exclusive, it is also very inclusive. It includes all kinds of people who have these characteristics, who are like, who are what the Lord is describing here. And <clears throat> the emphasis, really, that the scriptures is giving to us is that there are two conditions. There are two circumstances. A person is either in Christ or they're not in Christ. That there's nothing there's nothing in between that there's nothing that says well I'm, I'm i'm kind of in i'm half in i think i'm in i hope i'm in you are either in or you're not in and of course it's the lord who knows the answer to that question as to whether we really are the genuine disciple that the lord is painted that is um that is giving that he's giving to us here so the other aspect of what the lord is showing us here is that he's really turning the world upside down. This is upside down teaching. Because all these characteristics here are not particularly natural to people. And the people that Jesus was contemporary with, those who were the leaders in Israel, had quite a different perception about being in the kingdom of God, being in the kingdom of heaven. Their focus was on externals, the thing you did that impressed people that you really were good or righteous or godly. And Jesus is turning this around and saying, look, that's nothing to do. What, what you are externally is not particularly related to what you are internally. And so we find then, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is sitting here on this mount and he's giving this discourse. And he is telling us about the qualifications, but put in, visualize in your mind a contrast. Contrast Jesus on this mount with another mount on which Moses was so many years ago, that years before, that was full of fire and thunder, earthquake, wind. And the people heard the voice of God and they were terrified. And Jesus, of course, was the mediator of that covenant that was made at that time, just as Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant to which we are related. And the contrast, brothers and sisters, is this. On Mount Sinai, you have this voice of thunder. You have the fire. You have this, this storm and tempest. But now what we've got here on this, on this great mount to which the Lord is giving us his discourse, you have got the still small voice. It's no longer stay away. Don't touch the mount because anybody who touches it will die. It, it's all come to come to me and come take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly and you shall find rest for your souls. And Jesus begins with this very well known word in verse three, blessed or blessed are uh, those are the, the poor in spirit. And this word blessed comes from the he, ancient the Hebrew word meaning Asher. And it's the name of one of Jacob's sons. In fact, Zilpah, her second son. And what it means is it has this sense of great happiness and great, great joy. There's great joyfulness. And the kind of thing we're encouraged to try to visualize is the simple joy of children in each other's company just reveling in the happiness of the moment and skipping and laughing and jumping and playing with not a care in the world. And this is what the Lord is trying to convey to us, that the believer should have this sense of joy in these spiritual things. It's the simple joy of children 
And the idea as well in this, uh, this word blessed is not only is there this sense of happiness, but there is this sense of somebody walking a straight path, a dead straight path in a particular direction. And it's, it's interesting how David picks this up. I think it's David who wrote Psalm 119. David picks this up when he says, how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And so it's setting your mind, it's setting our minds on a particular direction. And in association with that direction, we have all these characteristics. But as soon as we do this, as soon as we focus on this, brothers and sisters, what we find is a competition. Because I want to be king in my own kingdom, and just as you do. I want to be in control of everything. I want to be able to manage everything. But of course, what the Lord is saying, no, no, no. You, you, in order to be in the kingdom of heaven, you have to surrender yourself. And in the surrender of self, you will experience the things that he is talking about here you will be the kind of person that is identified here in these beatitudes and it's this beatitudes of course is, is a term that's come to us and we know what it means and it really comes from the the, the latin and through through french and what the idea of the lord is, is is conveying to us here is that from the natural person we are when we want to be king in our own kingdom we we have to change something has to be different in us in what he is doing is turning the, the, the world upside down to give spiritual values a priority and a position and in relation to that Jesus is saying to really be the kind of person that I'm talking about you have to be born again and immediately we, our minds go to John chapter 3 with Jesus' words to Nicodemus. And he uses that phrase, except or unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now we think about those phrases, born of water, born of the spirit. And we appreciate that, of course, born of water really means baptism. But what is just as significant, and I would suggest to you comes first, is being born of the spirit and what that means is having the conviction of the gospel that we are converted and the demonstration of that conversion is in being born of water but then there's more to it than this brothers and sisters while baptism may be a once in a lifetime event being born again spiritually is something that is an everyday event because there's always this competition in our souls there's always the me aspect and that sometimes wants to take priority over the lord's aspect and what we find in this particular in this particular respect is to ask the question well how are we to be born again? How are we to be born of the Spirit every day in our lives? Well, I think the Apostle Paul gives us the answer. He tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we must be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And it's this renewing of the mind every day that becomes very significant and very important in relation to these words that the Lord Jesus is, is, is speaking here. You see, Jesus is telling us the kind of person we need to be before we can do the things that God wants us to do. In other words, the motivation for our behavior comes from inside us. And so what we, what, what we do in our actions, in our words, our thinking, can't be separated with the funda fundamental, if you like, gut person that we are in, in the innermost part of our being. They can't be separated. You can't sort of try to be good on the outside, but not good on the inside. You may remember that the Lord Jesus in his ministry, 
his strongest words of condemnation weren't for the, the tax collectors, the, the, the sinners. They were for the hypocrites, those who pretended, those who had an appearance of righteousness, but really they weren't righteous at all. And they were very strong words that the Lord Jesus spoke against them. So when we look at these three chapters that we've, look, we've got today in today's reading, tomorrow and Tuesday, in these three chapters that are commonly called the Sermon on the Mount, there's really one word that, that comes out of all these three chapters. It's the same word. It's the word truth. The word true. And really to summarize at a very high level, these three chapters, we could say that chapter five is all about true righteousness. Chapter six, which of course contains what we generally term as the Lord's Prayer and forgiveness and things like that and appearances, it's true worship genuine worship don't 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 paint your face so that you look as though you're fasting don't you in fact you wash your face and you look healthy but really you're fasting that that's the genuine person who's fasting and chapter seven brothers and sisters is all about judgment and it's true judgment that the lord is speaking about in those church those chapters so what we have here is a picture of true righteousness true worship and true judgment and all of those things we are involved in every day of our lives and this word righteousness is particularly interesting because it occurs hundreds of times in in the scriptures and basically if we if we try to analyze it and think about it we know what the word right means it means sort of correct and in this sense it's really acting and believing in God and doing what God requires and the motivation for that is in our character and in the depths of our soul let, let me read to you something righteousness is life lived with the vision of God and his purpose constantly before our eyes and being accomplished in the world and in ourselves, it becomes the controlling power in our character and conduct. And those, that sentence is taken from the book Teaching of the Master by Brother Lou Sargent. And having read uh, many things concerning these three chapters, I would suggest to you that that is probably the most outstanding book there is on these three chapters. It's called The Teaching of the Master. And if you go online to the Christadelphian office, you can buy that book as an ebook for less than five dollars. It's well worth purchasing and reading more than once, two or three times, because Brother Sergeant really does bring out the essence of these three chapters in, 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 what, in, what, he's, in, what, in what he's saying. And the righteousness that is being discussed here is quite different from that of the Pharisees. And you remember we've the, 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 a key point of what we've got here in this chapter five is Jesus says, I say to you that except, there we are, they've got that word except, or unless, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of these scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there's the, the, there's the position, brothers and sisters. The scribes and Pharisees who were so good at pretending that they were somebody that they were not, had a righteousness of their own standards, but not, it was worth nothing by divine standards. You see, all their righteousness was fo focused on praying when people saw them, giving when people saw them and they heard the money going down into the, in, into the temple coffers and fasting. And to them, the external was all important. And for, for us, brothers and sisters, yes, the external does have some importance, but it's what motivates the, the, the external. 
So what we have, brothers and sisters, here in these three chapters, if we might, we can perhaps summarize it in one respect, is that this is, in a sense, a biography or a portrayal of Jesus of Nazareth. Because Jesus was all of the attributes that we have in these three chapters, and indeed in the, in the, entire, in the entire scripture. But focusing on these chapters, and, and we, we find that Jesus has got all these attributes here in, well, that are given to us in Matthew chapter 5, really verses 3 to, to 12. He lived each of these attributes to the full. And in order to manifest any one of them, we have to have all of them in our heart and mind. All of these attributes, brothers and sisters, constitute what the Apostle Paul called the fruit of, you know the phrase, the fruit of the Spirit. And the task of the saint is to model and to demonstrate that fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> and in this measure, and by doing this, we will be born again in our own hearts and minds. And the being born again and having these things set in our hearts and minds, we will indeed model these things before one another and indeed before the world. So Jesus uh, begins by saying, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now what Jesus is not saying is blessed are those who are poor spirited, who have the wrong opinion about themselves. And the idea here is that it's a metaphor, it, it's, a, it's something we can relate to, of somebody standing before the Lord, like somebody, a guilty person standing before a judge in a court and realizing they have absolutely no defense, no one to speak on their behalf to defend them and claim that they're innocent. The, the, the picture is of somebody who has this characteristic of being dependent upon divine grace. And of course, we know that is true for the Lord Jesus in his ministry. He was totally dependent upon his father. As his father was, so was he. And his trust in the father that when he laid down his life, he indeed would be resurrected to come out of the tomb. But as the scriptures tell us, God dwells in a very high and lofty place but he also dwells somewhere else he dwells with the contrite and the low those who are lowly of heart and you have this picture in the sea of galilee when peter and his business companions have gone out and caught fish at the, at the instruction of the master and they've caught this huge catch of fish and peter falls down before jesus and says lord depart from me i'm a sinful man and the idea here is to be poor in these words of Jesus is not an accident of accident of circumstance. It is a quality of life, a life that is not centered in possession and not rooted in the present world order. Again, to quote Brother Sargent, you see, this poverty is not because we've lost our job, we've lost our house or circumstances like that. Rather, it is it is a quality of life, a quality of thinking that is not easy for us to create. But in a sense, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in what sense can we understand that? Well, I suggest it's this. In the first epistle of John, uh, the apostle writes to, the, writes to us and says, look, these things have I written unto you that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Now, was John suggesting that the believers have eternal life in that sense of the word as we would normally understand it? No, he isn't. You see, there's a difference between the way John is using eternal life and the word immortality. John is using the phrase eternal life in the sense of a mode of living. And that's the way in which the Lord is speaking here about those who are in, who, who, um, who, who theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a mode of living that is related to the kingdom of heaven. So then there are the mournful. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's a state 
of truth, statement of truth, brothers and sisters, that although the world may not realize it, they are really in a very sad situation because of sin in the narrow sense and in the broadest of sense. But it's also the people who are dis Jesus is describing are those who mourn because of sin in all of its manifestations, and we see an abundance of this in the world, but also for the consequences, even in ourselves, when somehow we've done something grievously wrong, and there's this sense of guilt and this sense of deep mourning. And there are many instances in scripture where people have uh, sinned grievously and seek repentance and have received it. And what Jesus is doing in these words, he's giving those who mourn the liberty. You remember Isaiah chapter 61 to proclaim liberty to those who are in prison. It's the, it's the liberty that is being spoken about here that is, so, that, that, that is rooted in the Old Testament scripture. This is the gospel. This is the good news that all of us can receive, that we will be comforted. And there is comfort, brothers and sisters, even as we take these emblems, that there is, there is this forgiveness which the which is in these emblems then there's the meek and it's more than being humble it's being teachable it's taking on the yoke of christ and learning of him and being in being being be, uh, and finding rest for our souls it's it's this disposition brothers and sisters whereby we listen to the scriptures we heed the scriptures and we live by them and that is the the, 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 the key point of this, this word that Jesus is using. It, it's, it's the promise of inheritance in the kingdom that is, that is a result of us being teachable and amenable to the gospel. Now, if we look at all these things, we wonder, well, how are we to achieve it? How are we to have these dispositions? I think the answer is given to us in the very next verse, which is verse 6. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Brothers and sisters, hunger, food and drink after breathing is the most important aspect of our life. We, will, we can live for about six weeks without eating. We can live for about three or four days without drinking. After that, our life would end. So eating and drinking is a key component of our life. And... It's the idea here as being famished for something and absolutely gasping for breath and urgently needing uh, the, the, the uh, urgently needing drink that can sustain us. And this is the idea that um, Jesus is talking about. And of course, when we look at life, we can hunger for things, the wrong things. We can thirst for things that are the wrong things. And in fact, to the point where we can create addictions that are very destructive, as we well know. As we look, uh, 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 as we we don't have to hear very much of the world's news to realize that people are are addicted to things that are very destructive. But what the Lord is talking about here is having this passion, that this being famished for the Word of God and, and and being filled, being satisfied with the sustenance that it will give that it will give to us. And again, let's remember that what the Lord is talking about here is in relation to these aspects of righteousness and righteousness and justification go together brothers and sisters having a right relationship with god and it goes right back well to well we think about abraham being counted righteous because he was he, he because he believed god he was justified by his faith says the apostle says the apostle and it's all these things and there's this this promise that they these people it's only those who will be fulfilled. And we find that in all the pursuits of the world, ultimately in the end, they come to nothing. But the pursuit of righteousness in sincerity and truth will bear fruit to eternal life. And then there is this wonderful characteristic that we have, which we sung about, the merciful. And the great point about this, uh, this attribute, brothers and sisters, that it is the dominant characteristic of the almighty you remember what god said to moses on mount sinai when god when moses wanted to see his glory the glory was in the declaration merciful gracious long-suffering these are all the characteristics of the almighty and this is this 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 aspect of mercy is related to judging as well we've got in chapter 7 of, of matthew you see it's the moat and the beam 
And when we think about it, very often the cause of a person not being merciful is because of their own human pride. Because I'm better than they are. I don't have to show them mercy. They've done a very foolish thing. Why should I be kind or merciful to them? And this, this attribute of human pride that is, is the, I would suggest, almost about the greatest of all sins <laughs> that we can, we, we can live with, is, is the thing that really prohibits us. It inhibits us from manifesting this characteristic of mercy. It happens in the brotherhood. It happens in the world. And, but it's all about, brothers and sisters, forgiving and being forgiven, which, of course, Jesus emphasizes in chapter 6, uh, following his comments in that great prayer. Then there are the pure in heart. Do you know anybody who's pure in heart? If you look in the mirror, you'll certainly not see anybody here pure, pure in heart. So what is the Lord saying? What is, what is, he, what is he trying to convey? Well, surely it's the focus of the mind. Where, where does our thinking go? We think about David, of whom it is said, he followed me with all his heart. And the idea of this purity, this pure in heart, the Greek word is katharos, from which we get our English word catharsis. It's a cleaning out of things. If we've ever experienced something like food poisoning, we go through the experience of being very sick, but then afterwards we feel cleaned out. And that's the idea here of being cleaned out and having no hypocrisy. See, brothers and sisters, it's coming back to the genuine person, the one with pure motives. And, and, and how is it that we will see God? Well, the Apostle John tells us that we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. But perhaps in this life, brothers and sisters, with this purity of heart that we might gain by the influence of the word to the best extent we can, in a sense, we almost feel the flavor of the God of heaven in his character and his love and his kindness. And then we come to the peacemaker. The peacemaker. There's nothing like the joy of reconciliation. There's nothing like the joy of apologizing for something we've done that is so grievous <clears throat> and then being forgiven and having healing and reconciliation. And when we think about it, when we do do something grievously wrong, it's, there's an offense involved. It's the causing of offense. And when we go back to Genesis chapter three that was in our reading yesterday, when Adam and Eve transgressed, who was really the offended party? It was really God. The Almighty was the offended party. But who was the peacemaker in the situation? Well, it was God. God was the peacemaker in that situation. And he is the greatest of all peacemakers in the fact that he's granted to us the gospel. But you see, the peacemaker is like a coin in your pocket. It's like the loony or the toony in your pocket is two sides to the coin. And when you turn the coin over, you not only need the peacemaker, but you need the peace receiver. You see, the gospel of salvation is given to all people, but it's those who receive it will be in the kingdom of heaven. And you look at even in the brotherhood. We've all had our struggles and challenges and the, the peacemakers need to have a peace receiver and we need to be peacemakers and re peace receivers all at the same time. And to be the full peacemaker, brothers and sisters, it takes us to the emblems. It takes us to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, because in that sacrifice, that is the supreme act of being the, the being the peacemaker. And finally, the persecuted. Have you ever been persecuted for the word of God? You may have been laughed at. You may have been disliked because of your beliefs, perhaps even falsely accused or had a personal sense of guilt. But we also have this sense of self-guilt sometimes because we are unable to deal with our own frailties and weaknesses. And all of these characteristics, brothers and sisters, that the Lord is encouraging us to have are aspects of being the genuine disciple. And of all the disciples, of all the believers in the God of heaven, the one who was persecuted the most was surely 
Jesus of Nazareth. And he was persecuted for righteousness sake. And so what we find in these great words of the Lord Jesus Christ is that <clears throat> they all come together in him, in these emblems that we are now going to take in and to, to focus our minds upon ourselves in relation to these things and seeing the Lord Jesus on this mount with this still small voice of invitation calling us to come to him to take upon ourselves his yoke which is easy and his burden which is light and develop these characteristics as best we can because we have become genuine disciples having been born and being born every day of the spirit. Amen. like to thank our brother Martin for his words of exhortation this morning and helping us to prepare our hearts and minds for what we're about to do to remember our Lord Jesus Christ in bread and wine. Uh, not sure, Brother Ken, if you have the memorial hymn queued up. This might be, or, or actually what I'll, we'll do the hymn after the, after the reading. That's what we normally do. Okay. Um, We will take our direction from the, for the memorial service from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul told us uh, there, that uh, he told us in, in 1 Corinthians 11 the following, he says, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let him man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. At this time, I'll ask our brother Chris Westwood if he would lead us in giving thanks for the bread. Loving and merciful Heavenly Father, as we've been exhorted, that we pray that you will. Give us that rightful heart that is acceptable to thee. And we pray, Lord, that the bread, the symbol of Christ's body, that we partake in our homes, that we will be strengthened by it on that walk towards thy kingdom. Now, Lord, so we'd ask that thou would bless that bread, that you will guide us, guard us, and keep us safe. We just through Jesus' name. Amen. So when he had given thanks, when Jesus had given thanks, he break it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me.
We'll now ask our brother Jim Perks if he would offer thanks for the wine, please. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and thy wonderful name. We come before thee and thank thee for this wine that is a symbol of thy son's poured in blood. And in it we see his life, the life that he lived in doing thy will, doing God's will in all that he said and did. And we pray that we will take that symbol in us and that we will strive to follow after that example that he has set for us. That we will be there to help one another and to strengthen one another and to forgive one another as we also wish to be forgiven. So as we partake of this wine, we pray that we will follow that example that has been set for us. This we ask through thy son, even our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. After the same manner also, Jesus took the cup and he had supped saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now take this moment to share the wine amongst yourselves. Our memorial hymn is hymn number 225. Bread of heaven on thee we feed, for thy flesh is meat indeed. Hymn 225.
At this time, I'll ask our brother Dan Archibald if he would give to us the ecclesial announcements for this week. Uh, brother Dan. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. And um, on behalf of my family to all of you, we'd like to wish you a, a happy new year and God's blessing on, on, uh, on this coming year. We'd also like to thank uh, Brother Martin Webster for uh, offering to, to give us the exhortation this first Sunday of the year and to start us off on the right foot. <clears throat> um, it was a very appropriate and good exhortation. Um, so hopefully you can all take that to heart. Thanks, Brother Martin. Um, uh, sun, so Sunday school. Uh, there, this evening, there will be no uh, Sunday school at seven o'clock, and um, that will begin uh, next week for the new year at 7 p.m. This coming uh, Bible class, the first Bible class of the year will be this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., January 6th. The topic will be um, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's the first class of, uh, of, a, of a, the series uh, by Brother Bill Yake. It's a DVD, and presiding will be Brother Brad Stevens for that class. Um, welfare. Sorry. Okay, welfare. So um, this um, this past Monday, um, Sister Ruth Woods Woodside, who is Meryl Dawes's sister was buried at Highland Memorial Gardens, uh, North York. And immediate family members were present for the internment. And she, Sister Ruth uh, passed away uh, peacefully on the morning of December 20th at the Wexford residence in Scarborough in her 93rd year. And she's now asleep in the Lord and waits the resurrection of the dead at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Sister Vanya Higgs of the Picton Ecclesia um, was recently diagnosed with uh, metastatic bone cancer and her condition is very serious. She's now at home with her family receiving palliative care. Um, however, Sister Vanya is, in, is strong in her faith and trust in God and is uh, apparently facing the future with confidence in the Lord, which is great to hear. She continues to be in our, pra the prayer, our prayers to our Heavenly Father and the Ecclesia did send flowers to her to express our love and support. Um, there are others um, that we need to be mindful of and, and um, particularly of note, um, Sister Iris Spence and Sister Jean Willoughby are in seniors homes without access to visitors. So cards or phone, or phone calls uh, will be very welcome. And the contact information for those two sisters is in the um, weekly newsletter as well as our contact list. And just a general reminder to, 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 uh, to look, up, look over one another, to keep one another in our, our prayers um, to all have, who have need. General announcements. Um, so the first tidings of 2021 is available uh, and ready to download and share with family and friends. So that is a free magazine to anyone who wants to read it. Um, so it can be accessed at www.tidings.org. And if you want, you could subscribe and it will be emailed to you every month. So, um, you know, since it's free, it's, you know, feel free to share that with everybody and as many as who would be, might be interested. That's the Tidings Magazine. Um, there's also a reminder that our Ecclesial Library has many books and anyone interested in obtaining a copy of uh, if any book in the Ecclesial Bookstall you can contact Brother Phil or Sister Judy McKinnon. And apparently there's a kind offer here. All books may be purchased or bought and will be mailed or delivered to your home. So that's a very kind offer. Um, so let's take advantage of that. Um, also, Sister Kay Finner uh, informed us of a link to a Christadelphian podcast containing one chosen exhortation per week. I listened to that to went to one of those briefly this morning. It seemed uh, quite good, so uh, that's a great source of uh, exhortations. And apparently, they also have the talks, Sunday schools, and Bible schools. Um, it's called the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast, and the link's available in the weekly email. Next Sunday, 
exhorting will be Brother Phil Dwyer and presiding will be Brother Ken Eason. And for collections this week, uh, of course, there's the regular collection and the second collection, uh, I guess, uh, would be for the ASK and I guess that that checks or, or, or donations should be sent to Brother Josh Narges for that. And that's all the uh, announcements I have for this week. Thank you, Brother Dan, for your help on our behalf. And thank you to everyone who helped support this memorial service this day. Uh, without your help, it would be very difficult to do this. And we all of us appreciate those who can help with this great work, important work for the Ecclesia. Our closing hymn it's hymn number 423. And afterwards, we'll ask Brother Russ Dawes if he will close the memorial service in prayer. And I um, don't know if I got that the right order or not. <laughs> there you go. Hymn 423. For thy mercy and thy grace, faithful through another year, Hear our song of thankfulness, Jesus, our Redeemer, here in 423. Go ahead, Brother Russ. Russ, you're muted. Sorry. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace uh, at this morning hour to offer grateful thanks for the binding power of your word of life, your word of truth in our lives, uh, that uh, would help us to know to have truth in the inward parts, uh, for it's by those things that uh, we come to know you. And we come to you because we have been baptized into Christ. We have been risen with Christ and we seek those things that are above where Jesus sits on your right hand. Uh, we appreciate the fact, Father, that through the waters of baptism, baptism, we are dead to our sins and our life is hid with Christ and you. So we come to you this morning thankful for words of exhortation that can encourage us and strengthen our faith and hopefully help us walk, to continue to walk uh, in the truth uh, with a quality of life that will endear us to thee and to thy son when he comes. So we try to put on those characteristics which are meaningful uh, to try and be merciful and kind and, and meek and, and long suffering, sometimes forbearing one another and forgiving one another and hopefully putting on love and charity and realizing father that these things lead to hopefully a perfect life, a life that will endear us to Jesus when he comes as judge. And we pray that that day uh, may be soon. We're grateful our heavenly father that uh, your word of truth in our lives on a daily basis can be, can be a shield and a buckler for us to strengthen our faith, faith and help us to continue to look forward to the kingdom coming, to maintain a degree of, of faithfulness, uh, a degree of, of fear in the sense that uh, we tremble at your word and realize, Father, that the words of salvation that are there for us can strengthen our faith, can help us to continue to look forward to the kingdom and have, have your word of truth resonate in our hearts and, and reverberate in, in our minds to the extent that we may be found acceptable before Christ when he comes. We're a conscious father of, of those of our families who are not well and uh, seek your uh, healing hand on, on Sister Vanya, Jean Willoughby and, and others, Father, who, who need your presence in their, in their lives in a, a physical sense. And we pray that I would keep them spiritually strong and help us to contribute to the spiritual welfare of each other as we have uh, had this morning by coming together as brethren and sisters of Christ and longing for that day when Jesus will be here and seek your blessing now on all of our activities, all our thought processes. We seek forgiveness of sins and strength and encouragement uh, for the truth in our lives and ask for your blessing in Jesus name. Amen. Our closing voluntary is hymn number 356, after which the uh, Zoom meeting will be open for fellowship and chit chat amongst ourselves. Uh, hymn 356, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah.